Some of us might want to become president of science, and some of us might want to win the Olympic gold. Depending on who you are, one of those goals might be more achievable than the other, because sports come more easily for some than for others. And sometimes it comes down to how you prepare for an athletic event. But some people just have a natural advantage, like being left-handed. Come to think of it, a lot of professional athletes are left-handed, and Hank knows why. Most humans are righties, people like me who use their right hands to write or do football. But even though only 10% of people are left-handed, 50% of professional fencers are lefties. In fact, there are lots of southpaws competing in top levels of sports like boxing, tennis, and baseball too. So what gives? Do left-handed people have some sort of like good at sports gene that the rest of us don't? Turns out how certain competitive athletes rise through the ranks can mirror how populations of animals change as they duke it out for survival. Let's say you're a hungry house sparrow that has two main food-finding behaviors. There are producers who spend a lot of time and energy hunting for mealworms, or scroungers who steal food from producers. If there are lots of producers competing with each other to find food and not that many scroungers, the scrounging sparrows have it easier. There are lots of sparrows to steal from, and it doesn't take a lot of energy to stay alive. But if there are too many sparrows trying to steal, and few finding mealworms in the first place, the scroungers will starve while the producers will be well-fed. Basically, the frequency of a behavior determines how successful it is. And the more common the behavior is, the worse it is for survival. So ecologists call this a negative frequency-dependent model. This particular example shows how behaviors can change within a population of sparrows. Scientists also use this model to talk about how populations evolve over time because of selection, how animals with certain traits are more likely to survive and pass those traits on to their babies. Professional athletes can sometimes be modeled like animal populations because there are analogs for for different generations and death. Some people win a lot and go on to play at higher levels, while others remain at lower levels or stop playing. In one-on-one -on -one sports, like boxing or tennis, there's direct competition between players, and success can depend on different traits, like how fast someone's reflexes are or which hand they use, so a sort of selection can come into play. Now, there doesn't seem to be an inherent advantage to being left-handed. They aren't faster or stronger athletes. But they might do better as beginners in one-on-one -on -one competition sports because they're less common. If you're just starting out as a right-handed fencer, for instance, you have fewer chances to practice against lefties, so their movements might be a little less familiar and you might lose more often. Because there are so many right-handed people, left-handed athletes might be more successful early on and rise through the ranks, which fits with a negative frequency-dependent selection model. At higher levels, though, the lefty advantage becomes weaker because the pools of athletes are more mixed. There are a lot of other factors play too, so this model probably isn't the only explanation for this pattern. But wield those left-handed scissors, or foils, with pride. It can be helpful. So if you're not left-handed like me, and I guess even if you are, you might have to resort to other methods like mind tricks to make it to the top of your athletic field. Your mentality going into the arena could improve your performance and make your opponents do worse. It might all come down to the psychology of a game face. So here's SciShow Psych host Anthony to explain how game faces really work. Picture the most intense competition you've ever seen. Maybe it was a rivalry football game or the final round in an Olympic archery match. Whatever you're picturing, the competitors probably don't look cheerful. They might look serious, angry, or even hostile. In other words, they've got their game face on. The idea here is that a laser-focused expression can disarm opponents and make them feel uneasy and anxious. But according to psychology research, it can also do more than that. Putting on your game face may help you your performance, too. It's maybe not that surprising that many people avoid angry faces, but the cool thing is those reactions are measurable, so we can get a sense of exactly how these expressions affect us and why. Like in a 2018 study, researchers showed 37 people images of faces that were happy, neutral, or angry. Then. They closely measured the subject's electrodermal activity. Electrodermal activity can mean a couple of things. Either the electrical output of nerves or how electric current travels as it passes over our skin. But basically, it's a way to see how much someone is sweating, and by extension, how stressed they are. That's because fear and anxiety flood your system with hormones that 
boost your heart rate and get you ready for physical activity. It's part of the fight or flight response that helps protect you from danger, and part of that response is sweat. In the study, those who saw an angry face produced almost one and a half times more electrodermal activity than when they were exposed to a neutral one. So, the faces seemed to stress them out. And beyond that, researchers also found that the expression people were shown was related to the amount of personal space they needed. It varies a lot by person. But on average, studies suggest we tend to prefer a roughly 30-centimeter bubble around us. But in this study, people who saw an angry face said their comfort zone was about 30% bigger on average, or almost 40 centimeters. Based on all this, you might think that a game face is definitely the way to go. Like, if you have a chance to stress out your opponent and keep them away from you, cool. Except things are more complicated than what we see in the lab. Like, stress is an important factor in sports performance, but it also affects people differently based on their personality and background. For some, a little stress might be motivating, but for others, the same amount will be totally overwhelming. Everyone's comfort zone is different and depends on a bunch of factors, including stress management and experience. Genetics even plays a role since all kinds of genes are related to fear and anxiety. So putting on a game face might be a double-edged sword. You might psych out some players, or you might motivate them even more. But hey. That doesn't mean you should retire your well-practiced scowl, because studies also show that putting one on can help you perform better, at least on some tasks. This kind of connection between facial expression and physiology is called facial feedback hypothesis. The idea is that no matter what you're feeling, the physical act of expressing an emotion will cause your body to emulate that. And it can affect how you feel, although how much depends on the situation. Now, evidence for this hypothesis is pretty mixed, so not all psychologists are on board with it. But some researchers do think that it may be related to why a game face can help us out. For instance, take this study. In a 2019 paper, a group of researchers had 62 participants do various challenges. In one, they were basically put through a perfectionist nightmare. They were told to put together a 100-piece black black and white puzzle in only five minutes. The key was, before they started, some participants were shown examples of a game face from pro athletes and were asked to replicate it during the challenge. Other participants weren't given any instructions about facial expressions. In the end, the second group completed about seven pieces on average, but those who got their game face on completed an average of 11 pieces, about 60% more. As for why, the researchers proposed that this could be another application of the facial feedback hypothesis. Except instead of facial expressions triggering a certain emotion, the subject's brains were linking those faces with a certain behavior. See, over time, your brain learns to group different things and sensations, which helps it sort new information faster and easier. And this includes facial expressions. So in this study, subjects' brains may have associated their game face with accomplishing a hard task, one that required a boost in memory and performance. Essentially, the game face could have been signaling to their brains that they needed to pay more attention and work harder. Now, when it comes to personal performance in physical challenges like sports, game Game faces are harder to study, mostly because people tend to make them even when they're told not to. But there is some support for them. Like, one study looked at more than 4,000 images of World Cup soccer players from over 300 teams, and it found that players who wore angry expressions gave up fewer goals. It's hard to say why without more controlled studies, but some researchers have suggested that anger can be helpful for physical tasks, specifically if the task is something you might naturally do while angry. Like, I don't know, kick something really, really hard. Though again, we'll need more detailed studies to know for sure. Still, the next time you're getting ready for the big game, or the next time you're preparing for a big recital or presentation, maybe give it a try. It might just give you the edge you need. So game faces are pretty powerful. But in the end, you won't win first place with a game face alone. Sports are all about training hard the old-fashioned way. You know, turn sugar into energy and build up that lactic acid and get those sweet, sweet gains. Or maybe not, because lactic acid doesn't seem to work like that. Here's where that misconception came from. 
It's one of those basic ideas you hear scientists repeating all the time. Correlation does not imply causation. Just because two things happen together doesn't mean one caused the other. Well, back in the 1920s, they ignored their own advice, and the result was a major misconception that's still around today. Because despite what you probably were taught in high school, lactic acid does not make your muscles hurt when you exercise. In fact, it might actually help. It all started around 1920 with a German biochemist named Otto Meyerhoff. He helped figure out many of the steps of glycolysis, which is the series of chemical reactions that cells use to make energy from glucose, or sugar. He also kind of fit the mad scientist stereotype. If you've ever seen a scientist in a movie electrifying disembodied frog legs, well, Meyerhoff did that in real life. He took frog legs, just the leg parts, and he gave them electric shocks, making them jump and twitch. But after a while, they stopped jumping, and Meyerhoff found that the legs were full of lactic acid, or more accurately, lactate, which is lactic acid minus a proton. He and another scientist, Archibald Hill, correctly figured out the steps of glycolysis that led to higher levels of lactate in the muscles. But Meyerhoff also assumed that the lactate buildup contributed to muscle fatigue, stopping the frog legs from jumping around. When you exercise, your body uses up its main source of energy, ATP, within a few seconds. Then it starts to make more, using a bunch of different chemical reactions. And during a hard workout, your muscles start to rely more heavily on reactions that also produce more lactate. When you exercise, the pH in your muscles goes down, meaning they become more acidic. That's called, appropriately, muscle acidosis. The drop in pH may be part of what causes the famous burn while you're exercising. There was a clear correlation between the lactate buildup and a acidity in the muscles, and Meyerhoff assumed causation, too, that lactate was responsible for lowering the pH in muscles. This became a generally accepted hypothesis, and you still see it all over the place today. Unfortunately, as we all know, assuming causation can be risky. And in this case, Meyerhoff was wrong. Even though the lactate idea was well accepted, there wasn't much empirical evidence for it. And over the years, researchers started to question whether it was accurate. Around the second half of the 20th century, they started to pick apart what was really going on. One important clue was the fact that unlike lactic acid, lactate isn't an acid. That missing proton means it's a base. It accepts rather than donates protons. Meyerhoff's idea assumed the reaction that produced lactate also produced a proton at the same time, making the muscles more acidic overall. Turns out, it doesn't. The series of reactions that generate more ATP in the muscles do produce extra protons, which lowers the pH in your muscles, but the extra protons don't come from the step that generates lactate. And in fact, lactate bonds with some of those protons, making the muscles less acidic. Lactate also isn't involved in delayed onset muscle soreness, the pain you feel a day or two after a hard workout. Scientists think that comes from microscopic tears in your muscles. Although they are still investigating that, it's weird that we don't 100% know, but we don't. So despite what you hear from personal trainers everywhere, and sometimes even see in textbooks, there's no reason to be so hard on lactate. It's just trying to help. Also, a side note here. You're gonna want to tell people about this when they say, ah, oh, the lactic acid. Do it, but try to be in, in the least pedantic way possible. We have to be accurate, but don't be condescending. <laughs> Okay, so if lactic acid isn't the key to building muscle mass and becoming a top athlete, you might depend on a different substance. Maybe a more artificial, performance-enhancing substance? Well, here's how some of them work or don't work. We refer to them as drugs, but most performance enhancers are really just versions of the chemicals that you already have in your body. These are the compounds that your body uses to build and heal itself and keep itself healthy. But by ramping up the levels of these compounds in the hopes of getting more out of your body, you could end up putting yourself in a world of hurt. HGH, or human growth hormone, is a good place to start, even though we all have it. A lot of people have no idea what it is. Your body produces HGH from the pituitary gland at the base of your brain. It stimulates growth and cell development, and it works with another hormone called insulin-like growth factor 1, also known as IGF-1. HGH is converted into IGF-1 in the liver, and it has several effects throughout the body, including increasing bone and muscle growth. The natural production of HGH peaks during your teenage years, starts to steadily decrease about the time you hit 30, and declines through the rest of your life. Growth hormone does help regulate metabolism in adults, but its main purpose is really to spur growth during childhood. Since 1985, an injectable form of HGH has been produced synthetically, and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration 
Foundation approved it to treat children with growth issues, genetic disorders, and kidney problems. For adults, HGH might be prescribed for conditions like bone loss or high cholesterol or very rare pituitary tumors. Despite its high cost, a month's supply of HGH can cost up to $5,000, human growth hormone has become popular among athletes looking for an edge. A big reason for this is that it is really hard to detect since everyone's body produces it. Also, HGH starts to break down within 30 minutes of injection, so even the best tests can only detect it, like through abnormally high levels of certain antibodies in the blood, within 12 to 24 hours. But here's the thing. For all the athletes and dozens of sports who take HGH, there's actually very little evidence that it provides any performance enhancement. HGH may stimulate muscle and bone growth, but whether that translates into increased power, strength, or endurance is unclear. Researchers in California recently conducted a review of 44 studies of growth hormone in athletes. More than 300 volunteers in all these studies combined received injections of growth hormone for an average of 20 days, similar to a drug cycle that an elite athlete might use. While those who received the HGH instead of a placebo did increase their lean body mass by over 2 kilograms, there was no measurable increase in either their strength or their exercise capacity. There has been all of one study that reported a positive effect of growth hormone on athletic performance. At the University of Queensland in Australia, scientists in 2010 studied 103 recreational athletes and found that while those taking HGH showed no improvement in strength or general fitness, their sprinting times on a bicycle improved by 4%. That's all. Not a huge difference. But in a competitive event, 4% could represent the difference between winning the gold and finishing last. What several of the studies did find, and what anti-doping agencies have discovered, is that the performance does improve when HGH is used with testosterone. And do you know what they call synthetic derivatives of the hormone testosterone? If you said anabolic steroid, then you win a gold medal of your own. We've talked about steroids before, but it's kind of impossible to talk about performance enhancers without touching on them again. Steroids are a kind of lipid or fat molecule, and your body makes two very different types. One kind you might be familiar with are corticosteroids. They're hormones produced by your adrenal glands down there on your kidneys, and they're handy at things like immune function, stress response, and controlling inflammation. You may have been prescribed medications that are synthetic versions of these steroids to treat joint injuries or an autoimmune disease or just really bad poison ivy rash, which is why I took it. The other kind of steroids are androgenic anabolic steroids. The main one of these is testosterone, which, as you know, produces male sex characteristics. But these steroids also include compounds that stimulate the synthesis of proteins and, eventually, new muscle fibers. This process is called anabolism, and and the steroids that drive it are anabolic steroids. When synthetic versions of these bad boys are used illegally by athletes, actually abused might be the better term here, the combination of steroids and exercise can increase a man's strength by more than 38%, and it's at least that high for women. Anabolic steroids can be freakishly efficient, especially when the user takes more than one. Doping athletes generally take steroids in cycles lasting between one and three months when strength training in the off-season. This is also when they're less likely to get tested. When injected or swallowed, these steroids travel to muscle tissue where they attach to receptors on the membranes of muscle cells. The receptors deliver the steroid hormones to the nucleus of the cells where they stimulate anabolism, the synthesis of proteins. But anabolic steroids also carry with them some crazy side effects. Not only do raised testosterone levels often lead to increased aggression and sex drive, but they can also, strangely enough, lead to shrinking testicles, impotence, and heart damage. In women, steroids can cause facial hair growth, acne, liver damage, breast reduction, and changes to or total stopping of the menstrual cycle. Not that you were wondering, but I can assure you that this body is completely steroid-free. I mean, do I have to list the side effects again? Don't do that. Also, if you're more into aerobic activities, especially competitive bicycle racing, can I suggest that you not partake in blood doping? Bicyclists and other endurance athletes will often use anabolic steroids, but blood doping is becoming more and more common, in large part because it's harder to detect. This kind of doping generally works in one of two ways, either through direct blood transfusions, in many cases athletes use their own blood, or through injections of a synthetic form of erythropoietin, or EPO, a hormone that controls your body's production of red blood cells. In both cases, the goal is the same, to increase increase the number of red blood cells in the body to increase physical stamina. Red blood cells use a protein called hemoglobin to bind with oxygen and deliver it throughout your body. Since your body uses up to 20 times more oxygen during strenuous exercise than while resting, if you can raise your red blood cell count by having more blood, or with EPO, your tissues can keep getting the oxygen they need and you can keep cycling or whatever for a lot longer. And before you know it, you've won the world's most famous bicycle race! 
by cheating. The dangerous world of PEDs is of course not limited to HGH, steroids, and blood doping. The longer you look, the stranger the stories you will hear of athletes attempting to get an edge. This includes baseball player Manny Ramirez, who in 2009 was suspended for 50 games after testing positive for human chorionic gonadotropin, a hormone that women produce during pregnancy. Turns out it also boosts testosterone levels in men and can increase sperm production. Ironically, many steroid users take HCG after developing fertility problems. PEDs also aren't limited to sports where the competitors aim to be stronger or faster. In 2008, a member of the North Korean Olympic team was stripped of two medals after testing positive for propranolol. Propranolol is a drug used to treat hypertension and prevent trembling. The sport in question? Shooting. Similar PED use is also a problem in the archery world where shaky hands can lead to poor performance. And then there's deer antler spray, a PED that you probably didn't know existed until 2012. That's when NFL player Ray Lewis admitted to using the stuff in the hopes of speeding his recovery after tearing a bicep. The velvety tissue on young deer antlers contains high levels of growth hormone IGF-1 that I mentioned earlier. This is partly what makes antlers grow so quickly. Some companies claim that they can extract this hormone from the tissue and then put it in a spray that can be administered under the tongue. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You will no doubt be shocked to hear that there's no evidence that IGF-1 can be successfully delivered in a pill or spray form, even if the hormone comes from the antlers of some super deer in New Zealand. And yet, deer antler spray has fast become one of the more popular supplements on the market. So here's my advice to all the athletes out there. If the choice is between injecting yourself with synthetic testosterone that makes you sterile and unable to have sex, changing the amount of blood you have in your body, or buying some crazy concoction supposedly made from a deer's head and putting it under your tongue, I recommend choosing none of the above. Whether you're taking performance-enhancing drugs or not, sports can come with pretty extreme side effects. Those drugs won't protect you from, say, concussions. But Olivia might have some guidance for what could. From Little League to college football to the World Cup, sports is a huge industry. We play on neighborhood teams as kids, root for our favorite professional athletes, and buy millions of dollars worth of branded merchandise each year. But even if you don't personally care what the next big sports ball thing is, you've probably heard about what's happening with head injuries causing dementia in football players. When I say football, I mostly mean American football, because that's what most of the news and research has been about. But it's not just the NFL that has the problem. We're learning that concussions from soccer, aka football for most of the world, can lead to dementia too. And there are serious injuries that come with all kinds of other sports that have only recently been taken seriously. We know that physical activity is super important for staying healthy, so it's pretty great that our society values athletic achievement. But sports-related injuries are expensive, painful, and can have lifelong effects some of which we're only just discovering now. Some researchers are starting to think that for some sports, the risk of injury could outweigh the benefits of playing. But giving up on sports or completely changing the way games are played isn't really a practical solution. Football isn't just gonna disappear and most people wouldn't want it to. So researchers, coaches, and doctors have two main priorities learning as much about the effects of sports injuries as we can, and finding ways to protect players without completely changing how the game works. When it comes to risky sports, American football has been the big one in research so far. It's a high-contact sport where players are prone to all kinds of injuries. But even though there have been professional leagues since 1892, it's only in the last 25 years that doctors have really begun to examine what's happening to players' heads. And they're becoming increasingly concerned about the relationship between head injuries and a neurodegenerative disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. It's chronic because it's long-term, traumatic because it comes from physical trauma, and encephalopathy just means brain disease. But as brain diseases go, it's a bad one. Symptoms range from confusion and disorientation to memory loss, speech disorders, impulsive behavior, depression, and suicidality. Essentially, it's a form of dementia, but it shows up much earlier than most other types, usually when the person is in their 40s or 50s, and it seems to be caused by repetitive head injuries. The thing is, head injuries happen all the time in football. A major part of the sport literally involves slamming people to the ground. And as we know from our good friend Isaac Newton's first law, things in motion want to stay in motion. 
including brains. So when the motion of your head is suddenly stopped, like when it slams against another player's knee as you dive for a fumbled ball, the inertia of your brain keeps it moving forward until it hits your skull. You have some fluid in there to cushion your brain against normal jostling, but it can only do so much protecting. If a hit is hard enough, the brain literally rattles around inside the skull, which can bang up stretch and even break brain cells, interrupting their normal blood flow and chemical signaling. That's what we call a concussion, and it can take a month for the brain to get things back in order afterward. Now, it's not like anyone thought head injuries were good for people, but the effects were believed to be somewhat short-term. Then, retiring NFL players started describing something else lasting disabilities from head injuries they'd received on the field. Growing concerns led the NFL to create the Mild Traumatic Brain Injury Committee in 1994. Its main goal was to make sure that players were immediately assessed and treated for possible concussions. That was a start, but the NFL still argued that the so-called concussion issue was being overblown by the media. Then, in 2002, a doctor discovered CTE in the brain of a football player who died. People were skeptical at first, including the NFL. But over time, researchers discovered more and more cases of football players with CTE. At first, they thought it was just concussions that were the problem. But we now know that any kind of repetitive head injury can cause CTE. And evidence suggests that it's really common in NFL players. For example, a 2017 study looked at the brains of 111 former NFL players and found that 110 of them 99% had evidence of CTE. Since the brains were donated, the sample was super biased towards players with suspected CTE or similar brain damage, but that's still about a tenth of all NFL players who died since the study began in 2008. So at the very least, about a tenth of NFL players end up with CTE. At most, close to 100% of them do. Researchers think CTE happens because players receive so many hard hits that their neurons don't get the chance to recover after an injury before the next trauma. So cells become irreversibly damaged or even die, making the brain atrophy and shrink. It can take years or even decades for CTE to fully manifest, but there's no way to detect it early on when interventions could be most helpful. Doctors diagnose CTE by looking for what are known as hyperphosphorylated tau proteins, which also show up in other degenerative conditions like Alzheimer's disease. And you can't just open up someone's brain to examine their proteins while they're alive, so they can only diagnose it post-mortem. Normally, tau proteins help stabilize the structural proteins within cells. But hyperphosphorylation changes their molecular structure in a way that makes them tangle up and get in the way of normal cell functioning, eventually killing cells. Kill enough brain cells, and the person ends up with dementia. In the past decade, the NFL has changed some rules to prevent at least some concussions, and it has a whole set of requirements players have to meet before they can start playing again if they do get one. But concussions still happen all of the time and the guidelines don't help with other hard hits to the head. Meanwhile, the increased awareness of the condition has led to doctors noticing it in other sports too. CTE has been seen in mixed martial arts fighters, hockey players, soccer and rugby, and even in professional wrestlers. And most recently, researchers have found evidence for it in kids. A 2018 study in the journal Brain examined, well, the brains of eight teenage athletes with histories of concussions that died young. And the researchers found that one in four had those distinctive tau proteins, the signs of degenerative damage. The others had signs of inflammation and damaged brain cells, the kinds of things believed to lead to CTE. So it's possible that the beginning stages of CTE can start really early on, from just a few hits to the head. You might think it would be easier for younger athletes to go for sports with less player-on-player -player violence, like cheerleading or gymnastics. But they can carry significant injury risks, too. In the U.S., cheerleading is second only to football in the amount of money spent on student-athlete insurance claims. From 1990 to 2002, over 200,000 kids were treated in hospitals for cheerleading injuries. And a study from 2009 to 2014 found that the most common cheerleading injuries, about a third of them, were, you guessed it, concussions. Cheerleading is dangerous enough that the American Association of Cheerleading Coaches and Administrators 
developed a whole set of rules meant to protect athletes back in 1984. But even with oversight, sports can cause lasting injuries when athletes are pressured to start young. Take gymnastics, for example. Since being small has a ton of advantages when it comes to the physics of twists and flips, gymnasts tend to specialize in the sport when they're very young. Specialization means more training for longer periods with more targeted kinds of exercises and goals. It also increases an athlete's risk of both sudden onset injuries, like sprained ankles, and overuse injuries, like tendonitis, where the tissue connecting bones and muscles gets irritated or inflamed. Landing hard on thin mats over and over again can also cause stress fractures in your legs, as well as injuries in your wrists, knees, back, and ankles. While getting a sprain or tendonitis once might not seem like that big of a deal, Research has found that more than 40% of people with these kinds of injuries develop chronic conditions like osteoarthritis down the line. That's a painful degeneration of the cartilage cushion between joints. They can also lead to osteoporosis, fragile bone tissue that's prone to breaking. And, because yes, there are more problems, there's research suggesting younger athletes have more spinal abnormalities from repeated stress on their growing bones making them at higher risk for chronic pain as adults. That's a lot of potential health problems, and it's not like specialization and overly intense training are limited to gymnasts. Kids as young as 8 and 9 could need surgery for damaged elbow ligaments from pitching too much while playing baseball. And some overuse injuries are so common that they're named after the sports that cause them, like swimmer's shoulder or runner's knee. There's no easy solution to any of this, but the good news is, all this knowledge about sports injuries is starting to change how we approach physical activities. Injuries that might have slipped under the radar in the past are now being noticed and treated sooner, before they become irreversible. And research into the long-term consequences of injuries, like what's been done on head trauma and CTE, is helping develop better training guidelines that protect athletes. For kids, for example, the American Academy of Pediatrics official recommendations say that they should train for fun and social interaction not for intense contests. Then, competitiveness can ramp up as they get older, because their bodies can handle more once they're more mature. Which, okay, these guidelines are meant for pediatricians, not parents. But what doctors tell parents and coaches can change the way we approach this stuff. The AAP also recommends playing a bunch of different sports instead of focusing on just one because that reduces the injury risk that comes with specialization. And research suggests that early specialization isn't necessary for athletic success later in life anyways, so there's not really any reason to do it. But what about adults, especially when it comes to CTE? Well, it helps that we're developing better tools of the trade. Sports engineers are using the latest research to build better sports equipment, like safer helmets. But even the best equipment isn't going to prevent all injuries. So the other part of the solution is to try to make the sports themselves safer. Some organizations have already changed some rules, like in 2010 when the NFL started forbidding certain kinds of hits to the head and neck. But there are definitely more changes that could be made to reduce injuries, like developing better techniques. Safer tackling methods, for example. Having more severe punishments for players who do things that are deliberately dangerous would probably help too. Still, there's no perfect or easy way to fix this. If there's anything we've learned from the last decade's worth of research on sports injuries, though, it's how much we don't know. And with more research into the ways these injuries happen, hopefully we'll also find out more ways to prevent them. Because yeah, sports are great, and we're going to keep playing them. But nobody wants people hurting themselves. Sports injuries can have serious consequences, but there are ways to achieve athletic success safely, like wearing protective equipment and playing a variety of sports. So while you're choosing that next off-season sport to play, here are some considerations that you might not have thought about. Many, if not all, sports are inherently dangerous. In boxing, for example, punching each other over and over again, well, it's gonna cause some physical damage. But sports can affect athletes in so many more ways than first meets the eye. Even graceful non-contact sports can be deceptively dangerous. From your toes to your head, here are five unexpected tolls that sports take on your body. Now, on a daily basis, you probably don't think about your big toe very often, but it's required for things like walking and balancing, which is what brings turf 
fifth toe to the list of sports dangers. There are different degrees of injury that can all be classified as turf toe, but it's a sprained or torn ligament. The tissue that connects the base of your big toe to your foot can get injured if you're frequently putting on sudden bursts of pressure that overstretch it. This would happen if you went from a complete stop to a sprint or quickly changed directions. And that's a skill that American football players practice a lot, so it's no surprise that they sometimes experience turf toe. These injuries aren't exclusive to artificial playing surfaces, though. It's just called turf toe because football players experienced more of this type of injury when they switched from soft grass to harder turf. It's not the turf itself so much as harder surfaces that contribute to turf toe. So reducing turf toe cases might be an argument for real grass instead of turf in stadiums. But turf toe isn't even specific to American football players. Sports like track and ballet are also turf toe magnets because participants push off the ground in unique ways that put incredible force on their big toes, and at extreme angles. Softer shoes also increase the athlete's risk of turf toe because they allow a greater range of motion. So to combat this injury, a 2018 medical report recommends wearing shoes that don't flex too much in the toes. But the good news is that resting turf toe injuries usually gives them time to heal on their own. Going from the bottom of the body all the way to the top, this next unexpected sporting danger is starting to get more recognition after years of neglect. While it has an equally catchy name, sled head should be taken very seriously. It's a term used to describe the concussions common in winter sports like luge, skeleton, and bobsleigh. They may look like smooth rides, after all you're sliding on ice, but there's a lot of rattling around from the high speed and curves that can lead to concussions. When your head hits something, like your sled, your brain can hit the inside of your skull with enough force to cause a concussion. And sled sport athletes report symptoms of concussion with troubling frequency. A 1986 paper reported headaches, fogginess, and lack of equilibrium in luge athletes after a run, getting worse after more runs, though not much research seems to have followed since then. Even so, coaches and doctors for some downhill sports are beginning to suggest protective measures, like limiting the number of runs an athlete can complete per day, and adding protective equipment like helmets and mouth guards. Since headaches also increased with bumpier tracks in that 1986 report, track maintenance may be helpful in reducing sled head instances. While more research is needed to see how these precautions impact the rates of sled head, some change in the sport is definitely needed because these sports have accumulated some troubling stats. Winter Olympic sports have greater injury rates than summer Olympic sports, thanks to all those fast downhill courses. And of the winter sports, sledding sports take the gold for number of injuries, coming in at 26% of winter Olympic injuries at the high end. Recreational sledders can travel up to 40 kilometers per hour, and even at those speeds, brain injuries can occur, and professional athletes are going twice as fast. At this point, there are still relatively few formal investigations of sled head, so athletes are calling for more research. For now, the literature seems to suggest wearing a helmet and going down a smooth path are the best ways to limit injury. But sled head isn't the only injury on ice to make it on this list, because spending a ton of time at indoor ice rinks comes with health risks you might not expect, at least if they're not maintained correctly. Hazardous gases like carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide can sometimes be found in ice rinks. Nitrogen dioxide can react with water to produce nitric acid in your lungs. Low-level exposures can cause respiratory irritation, such as coughing, while more extreme cases can cause fluid to accumulate in the lungs. Carbon monoxide, meanwhile, gets in the way of oxygen sticking to red blood cells, and in the most extreme cases, this causes suffocation. But how much carbon monoxide you breathe in is an important factor. The authors of one study suggest that mild cases may be more common in ice rinks than we realize. Low levels of exposure can lead to milder symptoms, like lightheadedness. But you might be wondering what these gases are doing in ice rinks in the first place. Well, it's the work of none other than the charmingly innocent Zamboni. After all, they're basically just big trucks that you drive around inside. And that's all fine and dandy when there's really good air circulation and ventilation, but that's not always the case. In North America, there have only been about a dozen documented instances in which ice rinks were so underventilated that patrons experienced acute symptoms. However, milder symptoms have also been reported. You could experience small amounts of exposure to Zamboni exhaust as headaches, nausea, and disorientation, while a higher dose can lead to more acute symptoms. And one international study found that nitrogen dioxide levels were above safe limits in 40% of the ice rinks they looked at. Luckily, for more frequent skaters, outdoor ice doesn't come with the same risks. Now, the injuries so far have come from participating in sports, but this next danger comes up when athletes stop participating, although it's really when they start again after stopping. Historically, there have been several reasons for suddenly shutting down a training 
training season. For example, in 2011, the National Football League shut down part of the American football season over a collective bargaining agreement, and of course, there's COVID-19. COVID-related pauses affected athletes in sports from football to baseball to the Olympics. And in 2020, Major League Baseball reported about double the injuries compared to the previous two seasons. A study out of the University of Kentucky concluded these injuries were likely the result of inadequate training. In the same way, the football lockout of 2011 forced athletes to work with an expedited training season, cramming 14 weeks of training into 17 days. And this led to an unprecedented number of Achilles tendon ruptures that season. Your Achilles tendon is the fibrous tissue that connects your calf muscle to the heel of your foot. When you increase the stress on your Achilles tendon and overstretch it, it can tear. Tears even tend to happen in the same place. There's a spot just above your heel where the Achilles tendon has to stretch the most when you use it, and so tears or ruptures tend to happen there. It's kind of like how pizza dough will break at its weak spots if you try to stretch it too fast. Gradually working your way to the desired output is less likely to result in tears. In the end, about one third of these injuries are career enders for NFL players. But this is often preventable, and athletes can generally avoid it by working in enough training time. There's one more injury that can be shared between professional and amateur athletes, because it's not so much a sporting risk as it's just plain old human nature. If you celebrate your sporting triumphs just a little too hard, even that can lead to injury. A lot of the time, all it takes is literally jumping with joy. Just ask these NFL players. Cardinal kicker Bill Gramatica, Georgia wide receiver Malcolm Mitchell, Lions linebacker Stephen Tulloch, and Bears defensive end Lamar Houston, who all tore their anterior cruciate ligaments, or ACLs, from celebratory jumps that landed wrong. The ACL is a ligament that stabilizes the knee and connects your femur to your tibia, behind the kneecap. It can tear from sudden stress, similar to the Achilles tendon. When you jump, you're putting a lot of concentrated strain on your joints, especially your knees. The human knee can handle over 12 times your body weight when jumping, so you could give 11 of you a piggyback ride and your knee could still handle the impact. But it depends on how you land. When you land with bent legs, your leg muscles and bones absorb the shock from hitting the ground. But landing on straight legs puts more of that load on your knees and can lead to injury. Exercise, stretching, and proper jumping technique may help athletes avoid these celebration downfalls, though nothing can really prevent them from just landing wrong. So please enjoy your victories responsibly. And if you're trying to get some exercise into your life, proper technique and equipment can go a long way in preventing some of these unexpected injuries. So there are a lot of factors at play when you are at play. How's the air ventilation in this ice rink? Do my shoes provide enough support for the movements I have to make? With too much on your mind, your performance could be affected. But not everyone will be affected the same way. Some people are more prone to choke under pressure, and here's why. Imagine, if you will, that you have been training as a world-class figure skater long hours, early mornings, years of hard work, and you have finally gotten to the Olympic qualifiers. I know, it's a stretch. Yet somehow, despite all of your practice and skill a minute into your routine, you fall flat on your butt. We've all watched athletes considered the best of the best take the field with everything on the line, only to totally blow it. When someone who's otherwise really skilled makes a dumb mistake under pressure, it's popularly known as choking. And although every single one of those people wishes they could take that moment back, it's hard to give a simple answer for how to not choke under pressure. There are lots of reasons it can happen, and they all require different responses. People tend to choke in high-pressure situations, like the final dive at the Olympics or the last game of the World Series. But athletes aren't the only people people who can experience this phenomenon. Standardized tests, like the SAT for example, could cause anyone to choke. Or something like a video game, if the stakes are high enough. In a study published in 2012, researchers rewarded around 20 participants for accuracy in a game where they had to move their hand to control a ball and a spring on the screen. For the most part, getting paid more meant they did better. But when they switched the game to a harder mode with a really big reward, like $100 for a completed move, they were suddenly less likely to get it right. Basically, it was like they could use the rewards to 
motivate people to improve. But beyond a certain point, the pressure was just too much. But it's not just the situation. Some people are more likely to choke, too. It seems that people who are more anxious about their performance are more likely to mess up, at least when it comes to athletics. But you might also be more likely to blow it on tough tasks if you have higher working memory. That is, short-term memory you might use to, say, hold a phone number in your head before you dial. In a 2006 study, 67 participants were given a memory test and then given a bunch of puzzles. Half of them were told their accuracy was predictive of their general academic success to ramp up that pressure. The people with higher working memory were much more likely to freeze up on the harder puzzles. And they also reported feeling more anxiety during the process. To help understand why people choke, though, it helps to observe it directly. Which is exactly what some researchers did in a 2015 study. They gave 20 participants some practice on a game resembling Snake, that classic arcade game where you chase a dot around, before getting into an MRI to play while their brains were scanned. They found that offering big rewards to get a move right was more likely to induce choking, which supports this idea that it's being distracted by high pressure that causes it. They also found that if someone was about to choke, a part of the brain called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex became more active. This is the region that's associated with inhibiting a behavior, self-control, or thinking about the future. It's like the part of your brain that starts screaming, DON'T MESS UP, whenever anything important is on the line. But if people had this brain region become active with the motor cortex that controls voluntary movement, like if these two regions became active in time with each other, as though they were connected, those people were less likely to choke. This makes it seem like the don't make a mistake part of the brain can actually help influence the motor cortex to get it right, making failure less likely. But other times, it's more like a heckler on the sidelines. And other studies have shed some light on why these two seemingly opposite effects can coexist, which could help people who are prone to choking under pressure. If you're already really good at what you're doing, which is probably the case if you're, say, an NBA player in the finals, it may help to find something else to distract you, something other than the pressure. In research published in 2002, 21 golfers were asked to make a series of putts while either focusing on their swing and follow-through, or while splitting their attention between the putt and listening for a tone. They found that splitting the attention really screwed up those with the least experience. But the most experienced golfers did much better when they were distracted. Researchers think this has to do with the fact that experts have implicit knowledge to turn to when they're distracted, meaning basically knowledge you don't have to think about. And when they tried the experiment again with 20 soccer players, they tested this idea by having everyone try around with their non-dominant foot. This made the experts look much more like novices. They didn't have the implicit knowledge to fall back on when they were distracted, and they made more mistakes. Other studies have found that just telling people to hurry up can help if those people had implicit knowledge to fall back on, because they could stop overthinking and just do it. But other studies haven't found any benefit from distraction. So we don't fully understand how to prevent choking under pressure. But it seems like a little healthy distraction might help, and it might help more the more experienced you are. So in the end, it's a winning combination of mental and physical strength that earns first place. And if you're interested in learning more about the mental side of sports, you can go to youtube.com slash scishowpsych, where we've made more videos like this one called Can Exercise Treat Depression? Two of the videos in the compilation you just watched are scishowpsych videos. So if you liked them, you'll probably like others. Thanks for watching.